All right, everyone, welcome to our AI Trends 2023 series. Each year, we invite friends of the show to join us to recap key developments of the prior year and anticipate future advancements in several of the most interesting subfields in AI. Today, we're joined by Sergey Levine. Sergey is an associate professor at UC Berkeley, and we'll be talking through all things reinforcement learning. Sergey and I last spoke at NURPS 2019, where we discussed a similar topic. Uh, and before that, early on in the show's history back in 2017. Uh, of course, before we dive in, take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Sergey, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to have you on the show once again. Looking forward to talking about an exciting year in reinforcement learning. Uh, I'll refer folks back to our prior shows for your full background, but uh, why don't you take a moment to share a little bit about what you're working on? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm an associate professor at UC Berkeley. I also spend some of my time at Google. And I work on, broadly speaking, algorithms for autonomous decision making, reinforcement learning algorithms, other sorts of algorithms that learn to make decisions, principally for control of robots, although lately we've been branching out in my group a lot to control of other kinds of systems, uh, including dialogue systems and autonomous vehicles and things like that. Awesome. Awesome. So we've got a lot to cover and uh, we'll jump right in. I think you hinted on one of kind of one of the biggest things happening in reinforcement learning this year has been the broad application of RL to language models. Uh, and I think that's one of the first topics we want to dig into. Um, take us through some of your, uh, your thoughts on what's happening there. It, it's kind of a funny coincidence, actually. Right before I, uh, I went to NeurIPS this year, I started writing up a little opinion piece about the role that I thought reinforcement learning would play in the future development of language models. And this was right before ChatGPT came out. So sort of <laughs> at, at that time, you know, I thought this would be like a very fresh original perspective piece because everyone was thinking about maximum likelihood training. Uh, and then I thought I would table it until after the conference and release it afterwards. And then like in, right right after that, ChatGPT came out. So I was uh, uh, quickly trying to like edit my, my opinion piece so that it wouldn't look completely uh, out of place. Uh, but it was actually very re rewarding to see that uh, come out because now suddenly people, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't need to convince people anymore that RL would actually play a central role in the future of language models. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, I think is maybe uh, interesting to think about here, though, is that the way that ChatGPT and in general, this kind of RL from human feedback uh, system uses RL it, it kind of, you know, R RL basically has two dimensions. It has the, the dimension of uh, reward and the dimension of time. And the current techniques are really primarily hammering on only one of those. They are uh, figuring out how to use reward, how to use, in this case, human feedback to improve the system. But RL also gives you the other dimension. It gives you the ability to reason about sequential processes. And that's something that has been done a, a somewhat in prior work, but isn't sort of the central focus of the current methods. And you would think that uh, dialogue systems could greatly benefit from incorporating the sequential element in as well. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, and, and in fact, if you go in and you start uh, playing around with the chat GPT, you will notice some of the things that are actually um, shortcomings that uh, come from an inability to reason about sequential processes. So uh, essentially what, what, uh, what these uh, RL from human feedback systems do is they optimize each response that the model produces to uh, maximize its estimate of human preference. But when we talk uh, to, to each other, uh, especially if we have a more goal-directed dialogue, like maybe I'm trying to uh, buy a house uh, from somebody and I have a negotiation, right? My goal is some, something at the end of the conversation. So I might say something now that is not necessarily the optimal thing to buy the house right now, but it might be good to elicit some information which I will then incorporate, change my strategy around a little bit, and then achieve my goal better at the very end. Uh, and that's something that the current thing, uh, the, that ChatGPT at least, will not do because it's not optimizing for that. But in principle, RL could optimize. Can you give a more concrete example of that? Because I think when we think about ChatGPT and one of the things that it does you know, a lot better than playing around with GPT-3, for example, is this idea that it's kind of adding the the conversation history into the prompt. And so it kind of seems to remember and have some sequential awareness to it. Yeah, yeah. So so it remembers the past, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't take into account 
the fact that there are there might be unpredictable future events. Uh, one of the most obvious thing, ways in which this shows up is it will very rarely, if ever, ask you clarifying questions. So if, if you and I are talking and, and, you, and you were to ask me, like, oh, can you explain, like, a good uh, RL algorithm for this problem? I might say, well, but does your problem have this property? Does your problem have that property? And, like, how many GPUs do you have? Like, I might ask you all these clarifying questions so that I can, so that I can serve you better, essentially. And that's something that it will not do because it's not optimizing for that final result after many uh, iterations. Right, right. That's really interesting. One of the first things that I tried to do um, in my experimentation with it was try to get it to play 20 questions with me. And it was darn near impossible. I, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but um, the I think the best that I could do was get it to ask three questions and then it would just spit out the other 14 or, you know, whatever, uh, 17 in that case. Um, but it it was real. it didn't like to do that. Like it took a lot of cajoling to not just spit out 20 questions in the first response. Yeah, by a funny coincidence, I did exactly the same thing. Uh, huh. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. Let's maybe take a step back and have you talk a little bit about, uh, more broadly about RLHF and, and what that does. That, that, that paper preceded ChatGPT um, by a little bit, right? Yeah, so the the basic idea that uh, was described in the Instruct GPT paper uh, was that you could uh, take the uh, response the, the response from the language model and you could treat it as a reinforcement learning problem. It's a special kind of reinforcement learning problem called a bandit problem. So the difference between a bandit and general RL problem is that in a bandit, uh, you treat the problem as a one time step problem. So there's essentially one decision you make, you receive the payoff, and that's the end of your episode. Uh, so the, the action in this case is the entire response of the model. Uh, now, if you had ground truth reward annotations for every single thing that the model said, then you could run standard bandit algorithms. Uh, but in reality, getting humans to label every single thing the model says is expensive. So what they do instead is they actually train a separate neural network to act as a reward model. So they get a limited amount of labeled uh, samples. So the, the, the network generates some, some utterances humans label it, and then they tr essentially do like label propagation. So train a model on it to label everything else with rewards. And then they run a standard uh, bandit uh, RL algorithm, in this case, based on PPO, although, you know, that part I think is not that important, kind of just about anything would do, would do the job there. Has RLHF as a technique, are you aware of other places that it's been applied beyond uh, Instruct GPT and, and Chat GPT? Well, so the idea of learning from human preferences in reinforcement learning, learning is actually very old. Uh, but perhaps the um, the modern incarnation of that idea uh, first came to the forefront. I think this was roughly five years ago, uh, in the context of more standard RL problems like these little like locomotion and simulation tasks. You know, in work by um, uh, Paul Cristiano, uh, who described this uh, algorithm. It's like the, the optometrist algorithm for doing it. Basically, show the human two uh, trials, ask them which one they prefer. Yeah, exactly, and then use that uh, to back out a reward signal. Uh, and, you know, that work itself is like you know, somewhat uh, old, uh, classical, uh, and there's work on preferences going back even further than that. In fact, arguably, the foundation of the notion of, of rewards and utilities in reinforcement learning really comes down to preferences. Like the, the way you define a rational agent, an agent is rational if it has preferences that can uh, that satisfy an ordering. So if I prefer like, you know, bananas over apples and uh, apples over oranges, then I should really prefer bananas over oranges. And if it's the other way around, if my preferences are inconsistent, then I am not a rational agent. That's basically the definition of rationality. And there's a, a classical theorem that says that if you have preferences that obey an ordering, then you can, uh, then there exists a scalar value utility function, basically a reward function that will reflect those preferences. And that's the, you know, if you open up uh, Stuart Russell's AI textbook, like the classic textbook, it's called artificial intelligence. Like that is the definition of a rational agent. Do you, do you, think that the enthusiasm around ChatGPT and the, the fact that RLHF uh, is a big part of, you know, its creation, um, do you think that that will lead to a broader investigation of places to apply that type of preference uh, gathering and propagation uh, across different um, types of problems? Well, one of the things that I'm actually hopeful about is that we might actually see um, 
more variety and more interesting ways to use RL in combination with language models besides just preferences. So preferences are great because preferences allow, uh, allow us to optimize these models so that they do uh, things that, uh, that we want. Uh, but you know, there's the, like the, the the joke is something's like the customer does, doesn't know what they want, right? Like it could be that what you actually want to optimize is not people's preferences, but maybe something about outcomes. So if you imagine, for example, uh, so so for for an assistant, it makes a lot of sense to say like, well, yeah, people will just tell you like uh, what what makes for a good assistant. Like I like it when it gives me informative answers or something. But imagine that you're doing like tech support, right? You have a chatbot that's supposed to help somebody fix their like display driver or something. You maybe maybe you're less concerned about their preferences, and you're more concerned about whether their problem was fixed or not. So there, the reward signal might actually be something that is, on the one hand, more explicit, but on the other hand, much more indirect because it only happens at the end of a long interaction, and there's a, a very deep credit assignment challenge in figuring out what is it that you did in the middle of the conversation that caused the person to then do the right thing and then like and fix their um, their tech support issue. So I think that once we see sequential RL methods that go beyond just satisfying people's preferences and actually move towards maximizing desired outcomes will have uh, will actually unlock much more of the power behind these models. We previously spoke a little bit about um, one shortcoming of this this preference model and the the RLHF approach as being um, you know not aware of kind of time and sequence and, and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> Is the problem that you just described, is it kind of another angle on the same problem or are those kind of two separate shortcomings of the the way RL has been has been applied to language models thus far? Yeah, it's it's another angle on the same on the same challenge that uh, essentially um, here's here's one way that we could think about it. Uh, a language model, we, we call it a model, like uh, that means that it's modeling something. So uh, one question we could ask is, well, what is it modeling? In, in some very literal sense, a language model models the keystrokes that humans press on keyboards, because that's how all the text on the internet is, is generated. And that's actually like, there's something very profound there, because if you can very accurately predict what buttons people will press on keyboards, you understand something very deep about human behavior, because so much of our interaction is with computers. So if a language model really understands how people will act, how people will behave, then it should be able to utilize this understanding of those patterns to do a really great job of achieving conversational goals. And I think we've only scratched the surface of the potential for that. Because right now, the preferences stuff, the supervised learning stuff, it's really trying to get these models to act more like people, uh, to sort of uh, mimic people. But they, I think they can do a lot more than that. They can actually use their deep understanding of the patterns in human behavior to be much better at achieving end goals. And you know, there's, always, there's naturally like a little bit of a nefarious undertone to that sometimes. But you know, there's also something very good about it. Like if you if you can be a tech support agent that optimizes for minimizing human frustration, that's a really good thing. If you can be you know uh, uh, an AI enabled teacher that gets students to patiently uh, listen to a lesson, that can be a really powerful thing. And I think that we haven't unlocked that potential yet, but uh, with some of these technologies that are coming to the forefront, I think we're getting closer and closer to, to that. Well, talk about some of the research that has been done and published that you think will help us get there. Yeah, for sure. So um, there is actually there has been research on um, sequential decision making with language and various kinds of language models. Actually, for quite a while, it hasn't been at quite the same scale as the um, recent uh, human preferences work that everyone's more familiar with. But uh, for example, we could go back to um, you know, uh, there's some some work that I actually found very inspiring a few years back by um, uh, Natasha Jakes, uh, back when she was at um, uh, MIT. So she did some work that actually applied at that time very uh, early offline RL algorithms to very early language models. Like in some ways, this is the danger of being ahead of your time because back then the language models were pretty immature and the RL algorithms were pretty immature. Uh, but she had some work that put them together. In a very interesting way, she actually built a chatbot that would optimize not human preferences, but actually human sentiment. And there's a very subtle difference because preferences means a person says, you should say this and not this. Sentiment means a person responds to you positively. So, so what she actually optimized for is a bot that would cause humans to react more positively. And it was, it was actually kind of interesting in, in her work, some of the examples uh, you know, in, in some places it would just be like a very like upbeat, very happy bot. Like it would just say things that were very positive, very friendly. 
Um, but it was kind of interesting to see that emerge naturally from just RL and analyzing the, the data. Uh, but, there, but since then, there's been work that uh, approached the problem more pragmatically. Uh, there was work from um, folks like, uh, I believe, uh, it was Drew Batra from Georgia Tech that studied uh, you know, combining RL concepts with language models for negotiation. My own group at, at UC Berkeley, we've done work recently on uh, offline model free RL for negotiation and dialogue tasks. So my student, Charlie Snell, has a paper called Implicit Language Q Learning that applies essentially some of our recent innovations in offline RL, it combines them with language models. So this, this is stuff that's been sort of uh, percolating at the surface uh, for, for a while. And I think that it's also kind of right on the cusp where uh, it could be scaled up in an analogous way to these bandit methods. And that could, I think, you know, maybe as early as the next year, enable some of these much richer interactions. Can you talk a little bit about the offline RL paper that you mentioned so we can get kind of a, a deeper understanding of the possible direction here? So the idea in our work, uh, in, in, this was led by Charlie Snell, was that instead of viewing RL with language models as this bandit problem where you optimize for the highest reward utterance, you can instead take it to the other extreme and view every single token as a decision. So for every single token that the model generates, it actually optimizes for the future reward it will receive accounting for the fact that it might be talking to a person who might react in uh, unpredictable and stochastic ways. And is this across a series of dialogue exchanges or tokens within a single utterance or to turn? Yeah, so, so it's across the entire dialogue. So token by token, you know, some of the tokens are produced by the model, some are produced by the human. Uh, and just because of, of how the data is structured, the model can tell that like, it's, it's all lines of dialogue. So if the next token is the model's choice, then it knows that. And if it... it ends the line, then it knows that the next token will come from the human. Um, and the kinds of things that this can do is, for example, you could have an exchange with a person where you're trying to uh, do like a question, uh, like a, a guessing game. So the, this is actually a benchmark task that was actually proposed by uh, Dhruv Batra's lab called Visual Dialogue, where the answer has an image in mind, like a picture, a photograph. And the question needs to ask them questions to guess which photograph they have in mind. So you'll ask like, oh, does it have a person? Does it have a car, et cetera? And uh, one of the things that you could do with RL in this case is you could actually, obviously you could, you could ask the right questions to guess the picture, but you could also optimize for interesting outcomes. Like maybe ask questions that will lead to more informative answers, not yes or no answers, but like quantitative answers. So then you would actually ask the kinds of questions that lead to the answer uh, producing you know, certain kinds of answers, like more informative answers or or shorter answers or longer answers, whatever you want. Unrelated to, to RL, potentially, because I've not looked deeply at any of these works, one of the, uh, another interesting thing that's been happening in the, the natural language uh, community is the application of uh, large language models to kind of diplomacy and that the diplomacy uh, setting and like these strategy interactions seems like a an approach like what you're describing might produce interesting results there yeah for sure so um i think that's also an area where in some ways the community has only scratched the surface um so the uh, there's of course the really interesting paper from um uh noel brown and colleagues from meta on uh, playing diplomacy but one, one of the things that i would note about that work it, I, I think I think it's a it's a really inspiring paper, but and, and while you're at it, if you if you can give a, a kind of highlight on diplomacy for folks that haven't come across that. Oh yeah, for for sure, for sure. So this is um uh, so the the recent work from Meta. I mean, it, it follows up on a on a long line of work. Like I should say that uh, uh, I, I talked to Noam Brown several times over the past few years about this, and it's like you know the first time I talked about. It, him about it, it was like oh can we just play diplomacy without any language at all and it seemed like you know year after year this thing was just like rapidly gaining capability so this is something that he, he and his colleagues have been at for a while and it's actually really inspiring how such a long-term research agenda uh, can lead to such uh, uh, great results but their latest result which is i think actually really impressive is that you can actually get a bot that plays diplomacy which is a, a board game where you actually negotiate with other players and it will play the game very well and it will actually like talk to people and it will uh try to convince them that it's like it's not trying to backstab them and it will like make alliances, so, like all this stuff that uh really uh looks and feels very human like they even have this 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 example that i thought was hilarious where they uh they're running a server where the you know there's one thread that runs the actual strategic layer and another thread that runs the language model and the strategic layer crashed 
so the language model was stuck without any instructions about what to do, and it produced this dialogue that like it doesn't respond for all and says like, oh, I, I was on the phone with my girlfriend. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, don't, I don't have any. The, the, stra the strategy layer isn't giving me any moves, so I'll just make an excuse. Um, so, so this thing does some pretty remarkable stuff. But something I will say that um, the methodology there is rather. Um, uh, I don't want to say so much hand engineered as decomposed in the sense that the way they're tackling the strategic layer is much more similar to systems like AlphaGo that rely on large amounts of uh, simulation and self-play. So it's, so it's really kind of an AlphaGo style strategy layer that decides what to do in a symbolic sense. And then it essentially just uses the language model as like a wrapper on top of that. So it decides like, oh, I'm going to move here and here and I'm going to bluff and tell the person this and this in a symbolic language like you know, just in a hand engineer language. And then the language, then the model, language model kind of makes makes that happen. Like, yeah, yeah. The language model almost, almost like, like rationalize it. It says like, oh, I was, uh, you know, I didn't mean to like take over Belgium, like let me go to Germany or something like, but but it's not, the language model is not actually doing the strategy. So this is where I think we'll, we'll actually see some interesting uh, new developments in the future, because in principle, RL could be coupled to the language model much more tightly. And I think that there's actually a lot of potential in that because when you decouple the strategy from the language, essentially the strategy layer doesn't benefit from all the deep knowledge contained in the language model. Remember that this language model knows a lot about humans. It knows how humans will type words on keyboards, which is very deep understanding of human behavior. In their system, they're not taking advantage of that. It's uh, a one way. The language exactly. model is part of the output as opposed to part of the input. Uh, or you, know, you, you can think of it as providing features to the strategy model. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so I think that this tighter coupling, where the language model itself is actually uh, the one doing the deciding, leveraging its understanding of human behavior, I think could be a lot more powerful because then you could figure out that there's patterns. Like if someone's if someone sounds a little frustrated or if they sound a little impatient, you can recognize that and you can react appropriately uh, to uh, you know uh, take that into account when you make your uh, your your plan. Interesting. Do, do the most recent, uh, do the, does the recent meta work, uh, does the strategy model rely on RL? It, it does. So, so it works in a way that is, you know, roughly analogous to the um, methodology that, uh, that Noam Brown actually developed in, 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 in his PhD for playing poker. So poker is another uh, kind of partial information game. Uh, I think that actually, you know, in my opinion, his system is actually a lot more sophisticated in many ways than AlphaGo. Uh, I, I think on, on, at a systems level, it's obviously not not quite the same, but in terms of the uh, the game theoretic foundations of it, it actually takes into account partial observability, partial information. A very interesting work for anyone interested in game theory. I strongly recommend checking it out. Uh, but that was, you know, he essentially took what he had developed for poker and applied it to the partial information uh, game of uh, uh, diplomacy. So that's how the that's how that layer worked. Any additional thoughts on the application? of RL to language models before we move on? I think one more thing I might mention, this is perhaps a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's something that's quite important, that as we bring in more um, decision theoretic tools like RL into language models, I think another thing that we have to be very thoughtful about is how to uh, address the problem problems of reward specification and also problems relating to the behavior of these language models uh, in regard to things like deception and manipulation. Uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, that there's, a lot, there's a lot of work on this topic, but I think that especially once RL comes into the picture, we might have a lot more tools at our disposal uh, to define, like, what does it mean for a model to be honest? What does it mean for it to be manipulative, deceptive? Uh, these might seem like really major challenges, but I think the, the, inter, the introduction of RL gives us a lot more tools because in RL, we can actually reason about utilities, including the model's utility and the utility of the human it's talking to, and we can do things like define, build up mathematical definitions of deception and manipulation, specify those as things we don't want or, or do want, I guess, in some cases, and also potentially even um, figure out ways to detect them. So if you, if you can define what it means for a model to be manipulative, you understand its objective, you can figure out like, oh, this model is saying something to me, but based on its objective, it actually has an incentive to do something deceptive. And maybe that's something that we can uh, formalize a lot more in the coming years. Can you talk a little bit more about how RL as a tool set can help with that uh, and you know maybe uh, if there's an example or, or other work that you can refer to I think of RL as more of this tool for kind of driving you know exploration and and reward attainment um, as opposed to 
you know, something that's kind of defining these, uh, I don't even know the best way to, to say it, to kind of defining these objectives or characterizing, um, you know, different outcomes. What's the connection there? So um, there is a, a technique uh, called inverse reinforcement learning that has been around for quite a while, um, which like, if reinforcement learning takes us from reward functions to behaviors, inverse reinforcement learning does the opposite. It infers intentions from observing the behaviors of an agent. Kind of trying to, to say what is the policy that probably generated these behaviors? What is the objective of the policy? So, 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 so it actually goes even deeper. Uh, and th this kind of stuff has been applied in the past to problems like, you know, you observe somebody driving on a road and you figure out what is their destination based on, uh, on how they're navigating. Or you might figure out, are they in a hurry or not based on how they're acting? So these things, uh, uh, you know, inverse reinforcement learning has always been considered a harder problem than reinforcement learning because inverse reinforcement learning sort of requires almost like a, a mental simulation of what different objectives would well, what kind of behaviors different objectives would lead to and then you you look at, at someone's behavior and you say well based on my predictions like this is probably their objective and so so therefore if you want to do inverse rl you need to at least be able to do forward rl but once we can do forward rl effectively with language models it's not inconceivable that we could also do inverse rl and when you're talking to a bot or or maybe you don't know who you're talking to you're just talking to a person on the internet perhaps you can then infer some guesses to their intentions and that could be really helpful if you want to detect that you're interacting with a potentially deceptive or manipulative bot. Mm -hmm. Is it clear how we would get from how we would characterize a objective of a policy as being manipulative? Like what that even means? How, how close are we to knowing how to do that? I think that there's some basic things that we're lacking at some level, just a very mathematical level. We're even lacking very formal definitions of what manipulation and deception means. But I think this is something that's very difficult to define if you view the world as a sort of purely statistical kind of maximum likelihood supervised learning kind of terminology. But once you bring in the decision theoretic concepts in RL, I think it's actually a lot more practical to define these things. So if you have a partially observed uh, RL problem, th there are you know well-defined notions of beliefs, states, observations, and then you can start uh, writing down definitions like if the, the, the bot says something, it'll change a person's belief. I mean, you don't know exactly how it'll change, but you can estimate it. And then you could define deception, for example, as changing somebody's belief to be less accurate. So we can, we, we can this, is, this is not something that has been done very rigorously in the past. It's something that my students are working on uh, at UC Berkeley. And I'm sure there's many others that are working on that. But I, but I think that my point here is that now that RL and language models can kind of play together, I think we're getting to the point where we can actually formalize these notions, and it will actually mean something instead of being a purely academic exercise. So I think we'll see a lot more of that uh, in the next few years. Yeah, interesting. Um, maybe bridging over to some of your traditional work or the, the space that you've traditionally focused on, um, the kind of emergence over the, the past couple of years of foundational models and, and pre-trained models on the language side it's kind of driving a desire to apply those that idea more broadly uh, for example in robotics um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing there yeah for sure so um, I mean in some ways the the notion that large data sets and general broadly reusable models could have a transformative effect on robotics is also not entirely new. So uh, Abhinav Gupta, a professor at CMU, uh, myself, many of my colleagues, we, you know, we've been working on these kinds of things for quite a long time, uh, including things like uh, collecting large amounts of data with many robots working together and things like this. But I do think that in the last couple of years, there has been basically a lot more of the robotics community has bought into that as a, as a concept, as a way that we should approach robotics problems, in large part, of course, inspired by the success of that recipe in, in fields like uh, natural language. Um, but something that's something interesting that I've observed over the past year is that um, there are a number of different kind of clusters emerging in terms of how people think about that problem. So I think that a lot of folks are in agreement that large models trained on very broad multimodal or embodied data can have a transformative effect on robots. That if you, if you have a model that really understands how to interact with the world, how actions affect images, 
uh, and how to interpret human commands, that's great. But then the big question is, where do you get it? And this is where I think there's a few different philosophies. I, I have my own perspective, but uh, I could give a maybe a, a balanced uh, or only slightly ba uh, biased view of the yeah of, of the picture. And probably the, the two main schools of thought here, which are not mutually exclusive, but they are a bit distinct. On the one hand, um, there is the school of thought that says data from robots is expensive and hard to get. Internet data is cheap and plentiful. So perhaps the way to get large pre-trained reusable models in robotics is to maximally pull in things like YouTube videos or uh, large data sets like EO4D to get an understanding of the world from humans and then sprinkle a little bit of robot data on top of that to basically ground it in robot actions. Is that kind of akin to imitation learning or are you um, meaning learning, trying to infer behaviors, policies, objectives, that kind of thing? Or are you thinking like, world building, synthetic data, synthetic environment. Yeah, I guess I should actually say there's actually three schools of thought. I just didn't mention the third one. So okay. <laughs> so the, the so may, maybe actually I should start with the with 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 that. So there is simulation and there is definitely a a segment of the robotics community that subscribes strongly to the notion that we should simulate a whole lot of stuff and actually use that as a foundation. Now, the simulation approach has been very successful in settings where the environment is relatively narrow in the sense that basically there isn't a content creation bottleneck, like you don't need to like manually design a million different objects, but the problem is physically very complex. And a really classic example of this is locomotion. Locomotion is great because it's physically very complex. You can generate lots of random terrains and most of the complicated modeling is actually in the robot's body. And because you have one robot, you can model it very accurately, generate lots of random terrains and get very robust locomotion policies. But that recipe hasn't really panned out very well for things like robotic manipulation, because there the world is extremely diverse and creating all that content in simulation is actually very costly and time consuming. So, so that's why the, the videos, the, the human videos and, and data from the internet is so appealing because there you can pull in lots of content that has already been created by others uh, without simulation and instead figuring out how to solve the uh, transfer learning or embodiment gap. So you know, basically a human is not a robot, so if you want to use human data to get uh, uh, robots to be smarter, you need to somehow transfer that knowledge, figure out some level of abstraction, maybe at the level of uh, you know, visual features or something like that, and use that. And then, and then the, the, the last approach, and that's the one that I myself most subscribe to, is that uh, perhaps we can actually just scale up robot data itself. Perhaps we can just get robots in the real world uh, to produce large amounts of interaction and learn from that. This is something that many people are skeptical about because it's so costly right now. Uh, but the reason that I'm actually a, a big advocate of that approach is because um, if we have robotic systems that are actually useful, that are doing something in, in the world that people want done, we'll probably have a lot of them. So right now it kind of looks very daunting to have lots of robot data because there's relatively few robots. But if you have a useful robot, there will be many of them and then the, the data will come uh, in large quantities. Uh, the example here is that, you know, for example, if you're, if you're Tesla, you probably don't worry about transferring from YouTube videos because you have so much data from your own robots. So precisely. So, so if we get a, a, a robot that does manipulation in the home that is as popular as a car or a Roomba, then we won't worry about data anymore. So as a scientist, to me, it's much more rewarding to sort of work on the problem of the future once uh, a sufficiently entrepreneurial individual takes care of the deployment problem, so to speak. Uh, than to figure out how to patch up the holes right now. But, but these are kind of the three, what I would say, a broad approach of simulation, transfer from human data, and massively scaling up robot data. And it's not, I, I would say in, in all fairness, it's not clear right now in, at the end of 2022, which of those will be the, the most uh, impactful and the most important. Are there, are there recent uh, works over the past year or so in these various areas that um, you, you think are particularly interesting in kind of pointing out the direction that we're headed? I think that the, um, the learning from videos area, that's something where there's been a lot of action. Uh, you know, certainly there's been uh, smaller scale uh, experiments, larger scale experiments. Most recently, I think um, uh, the, uh, the Pittsburgh Meta Group, folks like uh, Abhinav Gupta, Vikash Kumar um, and, and their colleagues have been doing a lot of excellent work on leveraging the uh, Ego4D data set, which came out uh, recently, 
to transfer visual representations and uh, things like language understanding into robotic systems. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's a very natural fit because the Eagle4D data set has first person videos of uh, object manipulation from humans, from humans wearing cameras. So it makes sense to try to leverage that to get representations for robots. So that, that was a data collection effort led by uh, a, a very large number of people. My understanding is that the main driver behind it was Kristen Grauman uh, from UT Austin, uh, but with, with many, many colleagues. And that was really intended as a computer vision data set, but now the robotics folks are taking it and pulling out representations for robotic manipulation. And I think there have been some very, you know, fairly convincing demonstrations that the representations you get from these egocentric manipulation data sets are more effective for robotics than the traditional representations you would get out of like ImageNet or other purely vision-centric data sets. Is the, the parallel to, or characterization of that as imitation learning, is that uh, correct or is that, um, you know, are they kind of adjacent but not really talking about the same things? It's actually a surprise. That's actually a, a question where there's a lot of depth wrapped up in it. I, I think that the truth is, we're not sure right now because the way that a lot of these techniques work is they, they take this data set, which does have goal-directed human behaviors, train some kind of model on that data set that does some sort of prediction or association, and then pull out its visual features. And we, we're not actually sure whether those visual features encode something about the, the behavior itself or merely something about perception of objects. So, you know, then you take those visual features and you still do some kind of robotic learning on top of it and it works better. But we don't know, actually, I think, whether it works better because there's something truly um, action-centric wrapped up in it or if it's merely a better way to, like, detect objects. Um, and, and this, by the way, is exactly why I myself uh, advocate for a more uh, robot-centric approach because I think that if we uh, actually use robot data, large amounts of robot data, then I think it'll be much more actionable in the sense that there we can set, the, set it up so that it really does pull out behaviors and leverage the understanding of behaviors rather than merely visual features. Uh, so uh, in, in parallel to some of this work uh, out of uh, uh, Meta and, and some of these other places that focus on videos, in my group we've been focusing on using uh, robot data sets. We collected a large robot data set called the, the bridge data set called the bridge data set because it's supposed to bridge the generalization gap between single task learning and multitask learning. And that has uh, about 100 different kitchen tasks. And we've been trying to see if we can pre-train actually with RL, so that because it's all robot data, you can actually pre-train with RL and then fine tune with RL and get better performance. And we have seen, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, that if you're going to use that, that robot in those kitchen environments, that pre-training with RL in a multitask setting is better than merely learning visual representations. But of course, you know, I should, I should, um, uh, I should uh, sort of predicate this by saying that the experimental setups are different kind of by necessity because we have a variety of robot data sets, they have a variety of video data sets, and it's hard to have like a head-to-head -head comparison because it's like they're just different setups. So that, that's why it remains an open question as to, you know, what how those approaches really compare. And the data sets that you're working with, are they heterogeneous in terms of the type of robot? Um, it's, you know, some granularity, some level of granularity or other, meaning, you know, all arms, different vendors, different form factors, like what makes sense there? Yeah, uh, this is actually something that I think is uh, a really important uh, thing that we're going to see a lot more action on in, in the next year. So right now for our robotic manipulation work, it's still in the single robot setting. Many tasks, many environments, but one robot. We've done work on robotic navigation uh, this is like round robots that drive off-road, do things like sidewalk delivery style robots, where we have actually brought in data from many different robots. We have a, a recent work by, uh, by my student, Drew Shaw, called the Generalized Navigation Model that uses data from everything all, all the way from a tiny RC car to a full-size vehicle. Uh, we basically borrowed data from all of our friends at all the different universities that we know of, uh, multiple different robots, and we were actually able to train a navigation model that, that can drive new robots. We actually got it to fly a drone, although it was a drone that was pretending to be a car, so it flew at a constant altitude, uh, without ever having uh, controlled drones before. So there are no drones in the data set, and it can immediately, just in zero shot, fly the drone down hallways. Mm -hmm. So we're starting, but, but this is why I think this is something that will really pick up in 2023, because right now we're right on the cusp. Like We've got, for robotic navigation, seems to work. For manipulation, we're collecting the data now, but as far as I've, I've seen, there hasn't been a really great demonstration yet. But I think it's just it's like right on the cusp. And the thing that that picks up in 2023 in particular that you're kind of predicting here is 
uh, an ability to accommodate heterogeneity? I think so. I think I think we will we will see the emergence of models that can um, accommodate uh, multiple different robot types, maybe even different action abstractions, and get better generalization by leveraging all of that together. And there's already a little bit of a preview of this. So there was a work that came out uh, just last week from uh, from Google. Uh, this was the, the this was the team that I uh, that I work with in my part time job as a as a uh, as a Googler uh, called RT One Robotics Transformer. Uh, this was a, a large uh, effort that uh, took us uh, probably over a year at this point, although its roots go back much, much further. Talk a little bit more about that. I feel like we're still in the, the stage where anything that has Transformer in it is sexy and interesting. Yeah, for sure. So um, so the, the um, robotics uh, Google team, this is basically the Google Brain Robotics Division, uh, we've, we've been doing this work on scaling up robotic learning for a very long time, going all the, all the way back to the arm farm effort. But most recently, what we've done is we've scaled up imitation learning to a massive degree. So there's, uh, there, there are, you know, if you go into our offices in Mountain View, you'll see that there's robots in the kitchen. You know, you go to get a snack in the kitchen and you'll be waiting in line behind a robot because it's busy uh, learning how to pick up snacks, uh, typically under teleoperation. So uh, there's this kind of pipeline, kind of an industrial scale pipeline for collecting demonstration data that at this point has yielded over 100,000 trials of all sorts of kitchen theme manipulation behaviors. And over the past year, we've uh, taken that data and trained um, what is probably the largest robotic control model in existence. It's, we call it Robotics Transformer, Robotics Transformer 1, aspirationally. Hopefully there'll be a 2 and a 3. Uh, and it takes all of this data and it learns language, action, vision associations. Uh, to, you know, mostly to control this one robot. It's a, it's a robot made by uh, everyday robots. It's a, it's a Google spin out. Uh, but in the process of that research, we also, almost as a little side experiment, took data from our previous robot, which we used for robotic grasping. It's a different robot arm. It's a KUKA arm. And we just rolled that data into the same transformer model, more or less without any, any substantive modification. We just had to get the formats right to make sure like the images were the same scale and the actions were the same scale. Uh, and it actually worked. So the original KUKA robot was doing these bin picking tasks, kind of think like Amazon warehouse style tasks. The uh, new robot was doing these kitchen uh, snack retrieval kind of things, opening drawers, getting napkins. And if, when we combine the data sets, suddenly the kitchen robot could also do bin picking. So we could actually trans transplant that knowledge and get better generalization. Now, now this is only two robots, and they're, you know, admittedly, there's, there was a little bit of finagling to get them to kind of line up, so it's not the full multi-robot thing, and it's certainly not generalizing to new robots, but it's an early preview of what might be possible. I'm compelled to elaborate on my comment about Transformer earlier. Like, it's, I think Transformers have kind of come to symbolize this, you know, grand unification, perhaps, across different modalities and, and all that that enables, and... Uh, you mentioned you you mentioned that to some degree in there. I didn't catch exactly, but you said something about text. I thought you said text video and, and something else and, and actions. Can you dig into into that and the extent to which um, you know that is playing out this transformer kind of unification, or is that something totally different? It's more or less exactly what you would expect. So in, in the same way that uh, you could have, uh, so um, f as an example, there's been some, some work that does multi multimodal uh, transformers for things like visual dialogue, right? Probably the DeepMind's Flamingo model is the best known example of this, uh, but there are many others. So uh, there, there's been quite a bit of work that shows how uh, tokenization and transformers can uh, allow you to more or less uh, transparently manipulate multiple different modalities kind of in the same fashion. Uh, and that's basically the concept behind uh, uh, RT1, Robotics Transformer, uh, is that the modalities that these robots have to deal with, which are natural language instructions, image observations, and the uh, action commands that go to the, to the arm, can all be treated as uh, uh, tokens that you can uh, you know, flatten into a, a stream and process with a transformer. Uh, and that provides for a very um, kind of uh, generic architecture that you can scale up as you see fit uh, to process whatever modalities your robot has to deal with. And in fact, right now, we're actually working to include other modalities, including goals specified in uh, ways other than language. And, and that's you know, fairly straightforward to do once you have this tokenization architecture. What I'm most curious about 
with regards to RT1 and the this idea of a robotics transformer and kind of unifying the modalities is beyond generalization. What do you see that kind of positioning us to accomplish next? Yeah, so of course generalization is the is is a really big deal in robotics because you want uh, robot you want general purpose robots that can generalize to real world situations. In AI in general, maybe in AI in general, that. of course, yeah. <laughs> but I do think that there is another um, another point here that is um, you know something that we'll probably see a lot more progress on in the coming year, which has to do with how the knowledge contained in language models, the traditional kinds of language models, the ones that are trained on natural language. Uh, can inform the behavior of um, autonomous agents, including embodied agents like robots. And I, I would say it's probably fair to say that over the past year, there's been a lot of excitement about this, but probably the work that we've seen come out is really just the very early steps. Um, and I think that that's something where we'll see a lot more progress. And there's some deep pro- there's some deep questions there that have to do with the fact that language models, they really do understand something about what goes on in the world, but their understanding is, um, you know, lacking in many places. And, and there's a, there's some deep scientific questions on how to marry that knowledge base with embodiment, with an understanding of cause and effect in the, in the real world, with physical interaction. Uh, essentially, the language model can bring to the robot some sort of deep understanding of the semantics of the world but it's up to us as researchers to figure out the right way to get at that knowledge that actually utilizes it in the ways where, where it's useful, but avoids uh, you know, falling prey to all the kind of common sense mistakes that these models will make. Yeah, the, the picture that's coming to mind for me, uh, and it's, it's maybe very specific, and I'm curious if there's a broader example or, or the example that, com- that you think of, but um, I'm envisioning training some model uh, on all the academic papers that have been written about grasping and somehow using the language, you know, that model to inform a robot actually trying to grasp. Is that along the lines of the kind of thing you're thinking or? I think we have to be a little careful there. So I, I think that there's a, a lot of a lot of useful things we can get out of uh, language models like, you know, if I, if I need to, uh, if someone asks me to fetch milk, uh, well, maybe I need to go find a refrigerator. I know that refrigerators tend to be in kitchens, so I'll go find the kitchen. At the same time, there are certain things that a language model won't really tell you. And there's a, there's a reason for this, which is that certain things are very easy for people, but very hard for machines. And the things that are easy for us, we don't tend to put them into words. So we don't, we don't tend to write instruction manuals about how to uh, use your neurons to actuate your muscles to pick up a fork so you can eat dinner. Because like people don't need instructions for that, but robots do need those instructions. So, so I think that there's this gap, and exactly those things where the gap between humans and robots is largest are those things that we will not be able to get out of language. And that's okay. That, that, that's okay. That, that, that means that you know I'm, I'm going to remain gainfully employed, uh, and we as roboticists can figure out uh, embodied learning methods that will take care of those behaviors and then interface them appropriately with the rich semantics contained in language models. But, but that's where we get into the challenge. In other words... You think that where robotics, the greatest, um, you know, not to overspecify what you're saying, but uh, broadly where robotics most will gain from kind of incorporation of language models is kind of this broader understanding of the world that the robot is operating in, as opposed to, we've been talking a lot about you know, robots, a robot's going to get, you know, some understanding of robots, you know, from uh, an actuation and kind of how to move in the world uh, from what it's, what we're, what this language model learns. Yeah, that, I think that's basically the idea that, that for the robot to learn about phys- physical interaction, well, physical interaction is something you go and do, you try and you see what happens. But then when it comes to understanding the, the logic of semantics, the logic of how human spaces are laid out, the logic of how humans think about concepts, you know, that, that's something that a language model can provide, which would be tremendously useful. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, you, you referenced a couple of additional papers that you found interesting uh, this year, SACAN and Clipboard. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, so on this topic of interfacing language models to robots, there have been uh, a number of uh, works that have sought to uh, you know, explore different ways to perform that interface. And these range from 
uh, you know, kind of fairly um, like direct uh, approaches. Like, for example, um, a, um, a, a number of uh, folks uh, here at Berkeley, uh, Wen Long was the student who kind of led that work, uh, looked at just directly asking a language model to create a plan. So you could just construct a prompt and say like, hey, I, I, you know, I, I want to uh, make a sandwich. Uh, tell me the steps to make a sandwich and then attempt, attempt to execute those steps. Uh, and the, you know that was one of the first uh, efforts at, at really leveraging language models in this way. But I think it also revealed many of the shortcomings that like, yeah, like the, the, cement, the, the grounding, the physics and the perception is not quite there. Um, so at Google, we had some uh, work, this was the SACAN paper that looked at exploring deeper ways to interface language models and um, physical interaction. And the particular idea that we wanted to explore is whether RL can actually provide a way to facilitate that grounding. And in particular, not RL policies, but actually RL value functions. So a value function looks at the state and it says, can I do this task? So if you have a high value for a task, that means that in that state, you believe the task can be done. And what we try to do is we try to use these essentially as affordances. So you have you know, 20 tasks you can do, you look at the current world and your value functions predict, oh, five of these tasks are possible. So the world has affordances for those five tasks. And then you ask a language model, I want to make a sandwich, what do I do? And the lang language model gives you a bunch of steps. But some of those steps you can't do right now. The current state might not have that affordance. So what you do is you actually combine them. You take the affordances that are predicted and the steps the language model wants to execute and you intersect them to find the ones that are both possible right now and that are semantically meaningful. And that now provides you with the ground. So that, that worked a lot better for us. And I think that, you know, perhaps in some ways, this is actually only one step in that direction, because you could imagine multi-step versions of this where you might have a learned predictive model, like world model, that is more about the physics and the perception. And you would couple it to the language model to essentially decode sequences of behaviors that are both physically uh, feasible and semantically meaningful. And uh, I think we'll see a lot more research along those lines in, in, the, in the next little while. Awesome. So, uh, RLM language models, uh, pre-trained models for robotics. Um, yeah, I think the last time we spoke, we spent a lot of time talking about offline RL. And one of the things that was exciting about that field is just this idea that we've been collecting a lot of data. We want to use that data to make intelligence decisions and uh, developing policies using these kind of emerging offline RL methods um, was kind of a promising approach. Have we seen much advancement in, in that field this year? Yeah. So I think last time you and I talked was, uh, might have been 2019. So in the, in, in the intervening time, offline RL is an area where we have seen a lot of progress. So, uh, you know, the relevance of this, of course, to, to our discussion up until now is that whether it's for language, dialogue systems, robots, these are all areas where you can get lots of prior data, right? So certainly for dialogue, you get lots of data of humans talking to humans. For robots, you can load up videos or data from robotic experiments we've done in the past. So these are all areas where offline RL is a really big deal. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, has happened over the last few years is that we as a community, I think, have really nailed down a lot in terms of the theoretical foundations of offline RL. And I would say that compared to two, three years ago, we understand much, much better how to build effective offline RL algorithms, uh, all the way from theoretical foundations to practical methodology. So in terms of the theory, there has been a tremendous uh, kind of uh, amounts of progress from uh, you know, many RL researchers developing a, a deep understanding of how offline RL works and also how it doesn't work in some cases. So there have been some negative results, impossibility results from folks like Sean Cockaday and, and his collaborators uh, that show that in some circumstances, it's very hard. But in practice, there have been advances in algorithms that do make it very practical. Uh, and at this point, I, I think we, you know, if you want, if you have an application, we have algorithms that are kind of ready to go. There's still room for improvement, but with things like uh, uh, implicit Q learning, conservative Q learning, uh, other recent developments, there's, you know, there's a pretty good foundation to build on. Uh, and certainly in my group, and I'm sure many others, uh, there's now a lot more exploration of applications of these things because. Uh, what the methods have matured to the point where we can start trying to use them for dialogue, for robots, for autonomous driving. And, you know, I do think we'll see a lot more exploration of that area in, in the near future. Speaking of the kind of growing 
practicality of offline RL, by the time this interview is published, we will have already published, I think, um, an interview that I did with Tony Jabara of Spotify in the context of a talk that he gave at one of the kind of practical RL workshops at NeurIPS, uh, exploring some of the ways that they're applying offline RL and some other things to recommendations uh, for, for Spotify. Um, any kind of big papers that come to mind uh, in the field uh, over the past year or so, or, or you know, maybe, um, well, you can address that and then kind of where you think things are going. We can touch on that next. Yeah, I think on the application side, I don't think there have been really huge papers, but there's there are a few things popping up here and there, including the thing that you just mentioned, that kind of show that lots of people are trying to use these things in various places. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that was kind of a little surprising to me is I, I found out just a couple of months ago that apparently uh, some folks at LinkedIn had used conservative queue learning with their like um, I think it was like a notification system and and attained some you know pretty clear quantifiable improvement from that. So 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 it really seems like people are trying this thing and uh, in, in 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 you know different algorithms and different applications, but already starting to see some forward progress. And that's actually quite nice because just a few years prior, this would probably not have been possible. But I think that the really big results are yet to come. And I, and I do think that it could, that, that it's possible this will show up in places like dialogue and language models where there are large data sets and where there's room for goal-directed behavior. I think it might show up in areas like robotics. Um, that's certainly something that we're working on here, probably many others too, where you could potentially use offline RL as a very effective pre-training tool. Uh, we, we've used that here for, for, for robots with a bridge data set, but I think that there's a lot more to do there. It could show up in areas like autonomous driving, where uh, offline RL can give you a kind of a, a middle ground between a purely imitation-based approach versus a purely planning-based approach that leverages simulation. And it, that could be very effective because in driving, you need to figure out how to interact with other humans, which is something that's very hard to simulate. Uh, so I'm not sure where the, the really big result will first come from, but I think that uh, there's a good chance that we'll see that popping up over the next uh, little while. Yeah, yeah. When you when you look forward, um, yeah, I kind of want to ask about where you see the, the greatest opportunities in the field. And, you know, maybe one way to think about that is if you're, a, you know, a new researcher, what you should be focused on or... Um, I'm not sure that's different from everything that we just talked about, <laughs> but I, I'll put that question out to you and, and kind of see where you take it. Sure. So I think we could, if we step back a little bit, I can give a kind of a, a little bit of big picture logic for this, that um, at some level, if you, if we want very capable AI systems and we reflect on the lessons of the past few years, I think it's pretty clear that certain ingredients need to be present. Like it, it's, it seems pretty clear, for example, that large data sets are really important for effective AI systems. But at the same time, at least to me, it also seems clear that effective decision making is also important because you really you don't just want AI systems that mimic human behavior. You really want AI systems that accomplish uh, objectives that I, that actually do something, and that means decision making. So so that's some, some very high level logic. But what it points to is that basically we want systems that can optimize for outcomes that can make rational decisions and that can consume lots of data. And if we take those two ingredients and then we say, well, uh, if we want these two things, well, what are, what are we going to work on? It probably suggests that there needs to be some kind of RL component in there. And, you know, maybe it'll be like the uh, bandit style RL from human feedback. I think it'll be more like the multi, multi-step uh, sequential stuff. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that's more a technical detail. seems like some kind of optimization for behavior is necessary. And it also seems like the ability to use data is necessary. Um, so that's why I myself am really excited about offline RL in particular, because that does use data and has RL in it. But to be fair, it doesn't necessarily have to be offline. Like, you know, it could be that there's some setting where you can get huge amounts of online interaction. Certainly recommender systems are one such example. Uh, or it could be a setting where uh, maybe the methods have looked more like a model learning prediction followed by planning. And that's certainly a very valid way to approach it. But as long as there is optimization for rational decisions, and the ability to consume large amounts of data, those are, I think, the key ingredients. And I think for folks that want to get into uh, studying some of these problems, there are a lot of uh, opportunities from dialogue and language models to, uh, you know, uh, robotics, autonomous vehicles, all the way to, you know, to the more industrially relevant things like 
uh, recommend our systems, uh, things like that. So I think if the ingredients are there is data, there's a lot of it, and there is an ability to inject rational decision making, that's a good area of study. One of the things that historically, um, and, and maybe it's not in the rearview mirror fully yet, but has kind of plagued RL is just fragility and, and challenges with reproducibility and, um, you know, just the difficulty in, in difficulty in getting it working, difficulty in kind of writing down reward functions, like uh, all of these things. Do you think the, do you think that the kind of change in setting and like focusing on offline as opposed to, to online uh, has shifted that a little bit and kind of made it more readily applicable and address some of those issues? Or do you think that kind of solving those problems is yet ahead of us? And do you, do you foresee, um, you know, that RL becoming easier to apply, you know, in the near term future? I think that this is actually an area that used to be extremely difficult to deal with because not the problem I think is not just that RL was hard to use and fragile, it's that we didn't really understand exactly why. And I don't think, I don't think it's that we've made a ton of progress in solving that issue, but I do think we've made a ton of progress in understanding why, uh, and a little bit of progress in solving it. So one of the things that maybe, you know, it's going to be under the radar for many folks, but uh, in the in the core RL community, it's something that I think quite a few people are excited about is that I think we are actually approaching an understanding for what the heck is going on. And what the heck is going on in general, or what the heck is going on when it is not working? What the heck is going on when it's not working? So um, here's a one hypothesis, and I, and I do want to preface this by saying that this is not, you know, this is stuff that's still up in the air. There have been a few papers that have come out, you know, from, from my group, from uh, Shimon Whiteson's group with a student, Clara Lyle, from some folks at DeepMind. There's, you know, a few, a few folks that have approached this, but there isn't a definitive answer. But it seems plausible that the answer looks something like this. Uh, we can go back to, uh, first, to a more basic question about supervised learning, which is, how is it that we can train models with a huge number of parameters and not overfit catastrophically? Seemingly a completely unrelated question, but it, but it actually connects deeply to this. Uh, and it's something that, our, that, that, that machine learning, deep learning practitioners kind of don't really worry about because like, hey, the thing is working. But theoreticians, they, this keeps them up at night. Like they are freaking out about this. Because what the heck is going on? We're, we're breaking like the, the fundamental law of machine learning by training giant models and they don't overfit. So the dominant hypothesis is that there's some kind of implicit regularization effect that happens when we use stochastic gradient descent and deep nets. And it's in some sense that that effect has been sort of saving our bacon for the last decade by allowing us to train these giant models without overfitting. And lots of folks have constructed various mathematical models for what that effect could be. There's some very good hypothesis coming coming out now from, from the machine, from the deep learning theory world. But then it seems like in reinforcement learning, what might be happening is that that magic that makes supervised deep learning not crash and burn might not actually be working the way it should. Because RL is not gradient descent. If you're doing value function learning, it's a fixed point iteration. It's not exactly gradient descent. And we thought for a while, that ah, it's like kind of close enough. Like, don't worry about it. Well, may maybe that was actually a mistake. Maybe we should worry about it. And uh, there have been a few results uh, from, from a number of groups, including uh, from ours, that provide different mathematical models that do actually show that uh, you, can, you can set up your assumptions carefully and get a result that says supervised learning will work, RL will not work. Uh, and perhaps this offers us a hint for what the cause of that fragility is. Is it fair to say that the, the magic isn't necessary, isn't gradient descent, but all of the hacks and tricks and things that we layered on top of gradient descent. I mean, gradient descent started not working with exploding gradients and all that stuff. And, you know, we've come up with dropout and, you know, cyclic learning rates and a whole bunch of crazy like incantations that kind of makes it work consistently now. Is it just that we haven't figured those things out yet for RL? I, I think that that is probably at some level the truth, yes. Uh, and, and I think that certainly some of the incantations from supervised learning do help a ton in RL. And, you know, in, in our own work on scaling up offline RL methods, we have found that uh, if we're a little careful in using uh, the right architectures, ones that are bigger than one would think are appropriate for the problem, uh, have better grading flow, and are a little careful in setting things up, things can work way better. 
And sometimes those choices are not exactly the same as the supervised learning choices, but they're kind of in the same wheelhouse. But at the same time, I do think that more deeply understanding the theory, the cause behind the instability, might give us a little more guidance. I mean, in the end, you know, practical machine learning always comes down to tricks and kind of empirical uh, prowess. But a little bit of those theoretical foundations might help point us to where we would expect those tricks to come from, the degree to which they're the same as supervised learning, and the degree to which they're different. Um, so, you know, that, that's something I'm actually pretty excited about. And I think that it's flying under the radar a little because these are like very technical things. But I think it, you know, as, a, as someone who's like really deep in the, in the RL world, I guess I haven't been this hopeful in a while. Let me put it this way. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, can I press you for your top three predictions for 2023? Uh, I think my, my predictions are necessarily going to be a little aspirational, but what I would hope for is that in 2023, I think we, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will see RL with language models go beyond the single step setting and really optimize for long horizon goals in an effective way at scale so that we can actually get uh, language models that interact with humans and optimize long horizon objectives. I'm very hopeful that we will get some kind of robotics model that can be used by other people in the sense that uh, right now, if, if we develop a robotics model in my lab, it'll be used in my lab. If, if, if uh, Abhinav Gupta develops it in his lab, he'll use it in his lab. I'm really hopeful that 2023 will be the year when we really start seeing meaningful sharing at the level of you know, models that actually uh, represent behaviors. And I, and I think that we're getting very, very close to that. Um, and I think the other thing, the, the third one I, I would name, and I don't know who's, who's going to sort of have the, the first big win there, but I think we will see some kind of big application of offline RL that, that, you know, at, at large scale. And perhaps it'll be one of the recommender systems folks, because it seems like for these uh, web applications, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, initial progress in lots of places. Maybe it'll be for language models, or maybe it'll be for robotics. And, you know, I think in the long run, it'll be all of these, but we'll see who, who comes out with something truly impressive first. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Sergey, thank you so much for spending the time to kind of recap and look forward uh, in RL with us. Uh, very fascinating conversation and uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Sam.